Hello, and welcome to the 538 Politics Podcast. I'm Galen Druk. Last Thursday, President Biden announced his support for a bipartisan infrastructure plan proposed by a group of 10 senators, five Republicans and five Democrats. It would increase federal spending on roads, public transit, broadband internet, utilities, and more by about $600 billion over eight years. The plan excludes many of Democrats' priorities on social services and climate, which they hope to pass separately through the so-called reconciliation process with only Democratic votes. That has caused its own set of tensions surrounding this bipartisan framework, which we'll get into. We're also going to talk about what the incentives are for politicians to be bipartisan. Why are the 10 lawmakers in particular interested in working together? And how much does the public care? We're also going to look at whether Republicans' approach to climate change is changing. A New York Times report last week titled, A Growing Number of Republicans Are Working to Regress Climate Change, detailed some of the efforts that Republican lawmakers are making, including starting a conservative climate caucus in Congress. At the same time, public opinion among Republicans hasn't shifted on the issue, and the two parties' voters have actually become more polarized in recent years. Here with me to discuss it all are Editor-in-Chief Nate Silver. Hello, Nate. Hello, Galen. How's it going? Good. I'm in Las Vegas, Nevada. I am playing day two of the uh, win $10,000 entry million something tournament later today. So, you know, yeah. not I'm not distracted, though. I'm fully focused on bipartisanship. Much more exciting than poker. Um, I'm glad to hear it. We're all scattered across the country today. I am in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, I haven't bet or lost any money, but uh, still having still having a good time. Also not distracted at all by all of the bachelor and bachelorette, screaming bachelor and bachelorette parties around me. Um, also with us is politics editor Sarah Frostenson. Hey, Sarah, how's it going? Hey, Kaylin. Good. Um, any... Any exciting news to share with us on uh, this beautiful Monday morning? Not on par with your Nate's weekends, unfortunately. Fair enough. And I'll also say that our lead science writer, Maggie Kurth, is going to be joining us later on to talk about climate change. Let's kick things off with our favorite question, good use of polling or bad use of polling. And actually, so after the Department of Defense report came out last week about UFOs, I wanted to talk about some UFO polling, but I realized we had actually already talked about it recently on the podcast. Um, I think particularly with you, Nate, but do either of you remember um, what percent of Americans said that UFOs are explained by human activity and natural phenomenon and not the possibility of extraterrestrial life or just unknown? I'm going to go low. Was it 30%? Most people thought, yes, like... E.T. Yeah. Okay. Nate, do you remember? I think it was like, yeah, like, so maybe 37% are natural origin, or excuse me, are man-made origin. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. So 60% of Americans said that all UFOs are explained by human activity or natural phenomenon, according to a recent Gallup poll. Hmm. Right. So I'm wondering now that we have this information from the Department of Defense that there are 143 unidentified flying objects since 2004 that are unexplainable by the government. Does that mean that those 60 percent of Americans are wrong? Because the the poll is a little tricky here in that it doesn't give you the option to say, like, we just don't know. The answers were some have been alien spacecraft and that attracted 33 percent support. Then the other answer was all explained by human activity or natural phenomenon. That was 60%. And no opinion was 7%. It seems like the Department of Defense has re- revealed an answer here that is was not really an option on the poll. Yeah, it's a bad use of polling. Is that what you're asking, Galen? <laughs> well, I actually have a different use of polling because I couldn't figure out how to make this a good or bad use of polling. But you think it's fair to say that the, the Gallup poll here is a bad use of polling? Yeah, I mean, if you ask a dumb question, I mean, not a dumb question, right? If you ask a question to which the answer is we don't know, and you don't provide the right answer, because nobody knows, right? Nobody knows. Um, I don't, do you, are you sure no one knows, Nate? Are we really going to be that credulous? You know, I'm not that far from uh, Area 51 or whatever they call it, man. Maybe I'll go do some research out there. Now that would be a book. (laughs) Yeah, please do. 
Okay. According to the Department of Defense, there are 143 identified flying objects detected by the government since 2004 that aren't explainable. So essentially they said, we need more data. But the headline of this report was that unidentified flying objects are real in the sense that they have not been identified. But here's our actual good use or bad use of polling for the day. And in this case, I want to focus on the methodology that YouGov used. And they surveyed Americans on an extremely important topic, which is America's favorite dog breed. They showed respondents a bunch of different matchups of two dog breeds and asked them to choose their favorite breed. Whichever breed had the highest win percentage is proclaimed America's favorite dog breed. So essentially, these 2,500 Americans that they surveyed, you know, go through, take, take this survey and basically match up a bunch of dogs, say which one they prefer. First and foremost, before I give you the, the answers, I don't, know, I don't know if you've already seen the answers to this poll. Is this a good way of determining America's favorite dog breed? I mean, aren't all dogs good dogs? <laughs> <laughs> no. So jokes, pit, aside, jokes aside, so we have a serious methodological dogs. question at stake, Nate. <laughs> I mean, all dogs are good dogs, so to like force Americans to pit dogs off against one another seems like a bad use of polling. If hypothetically you were ranking something else, right? Let's say you're ranking your favorite burger chain or something, then this technique would be totally appropriate. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with this. Yeah, it actually seems to be a pretty in vogue um, type of survey method that you're seeing crop up more. Like um, I'm thinking about in the political realm, they've used it to try to get another slice of Trump's approval rating. So it'll ask you like a head to head matchup of two Republicans. Which one do you approve of stronger? How does that relate to Trump? So you could do something like that. You could also do it, though, comparing two politicians to say, like, hey, who's more conservative? And then at the end, you could kind of come up with a rank based on that. Um, so it's interesting because it's like it's not just asking, like, do you like golden retrievers? Yes, no. Like, is that your favorite? It's making you actively go through um, the comparisons. What is the benefit of that methodology to leaving it open ended? So I, I'm curious for Nate's thoughts on this too. I mean, it's a little debated. It's often sold as like, this is a better metric, at least in politics, because the idea is like, look, things are so baked in and partisan. If we're forcing you to do this matchup and you're not primed to think like, do you approve of Trump? Yes, no. And answering that based on politics, maybe you'll give us a more nuanced answer if we're asking you to compare like Sarah Palin versus Trump or something. And so partisanship won't activate in the same ways. Overall, like the top lines haven't been that different in the political polls than just like the overall approval regarding Trump. Um, you know, for instance, a piece we did in 2019, it still showed he had really bad approval, even though it was using this method. It seems as if the answer is to get around partisanship, to not get people answering in the same ways. I don't know, though, if it's always delivering on that front. It's interesting, though. I mean, if you have there are 193 drug breeds that you gov included in this uh, exercise. If you just kind of ask people, hey, what's your favorite dog breed? It'll just kind of be like name recognition, basically, right? So maybe Golden Retriever is a very famous breed, right? But the number three placing dog breed, the Alaskan Malamute, um, that's not really top of mind, right? But you see a picture of an Alaskan Malamute, you're like, that dog's pretty handsome dog. Uh, and maybe you realize that you actually do like that dog. So, um, so it's a way to like kind of be inclusive of like, of all these dog species and have more granularity. I can't believe we're taking this seriously and have more granularity than you would if you just kind of asked people for a recall of, of, yeah. It is late June after late a year June. and a half of a global pandemic. Nate, we are talking about dog pulling seriously. And I should say we're burying the lead here. And I was going to ask if you all could guess which was America's favorite dog, but I think you have both already seen the poll. Is that correct? Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so Labrador Retrievers won top dog with 85% of wins, followed by Golden Retriever with 78%, and then, as you mentioned, the Alaskan Malamute with 75%. Now, those numbers do not actually line up with dog ownership, according to the American Kennel Club, and we should also note that they did not include any mixed breeds in this poll. I guess they were just talking about purebreds. Um, you know, whether or not that's fair is maybe a debate for another day. But if we want to actually proclaim one dog America's favorite dog, should we use 
use stated preference like this poll does. So Labrador retrievers are America's favorite dog, followed by Golden Retriever, followed by Alaskan Malamute. Or should we use revealed preference, which is which kinds of dogs Americans actually own? And when it comes to that question, okay, so the Labrador Retriever is still number one. Fair enough. I think we can we can reasonably say that is America's favorite dog if both in the polling and in the revealed preference, the Labrador Retriever comes up number one. But number two is the French Bulldog, which only won about half of its matchups, and then German Shepherds, Alaskan Malamutes are the 65th most owned dog in the country. So which is more important, what Americans say they prefer or what Americans actually do when it comes time to pick their dogs? I think the problem, Galen, is that smaller dogs are easier to maintain than bigger dogs, especially if you're in an urban environment. So there's like an East Coast small dog bias, I think. Ooh, I love how seriously we're taking this. No, people would, I think there are lots of people, like, I'd love to have, like, a big old, like, German Shepherd, but, like, it needs a big yard, and maybe I live in um, an apartment uh, in Brooklyn, New York, where I go to the hipster coffee shop and have my job working for Vox or something, and, like, I don't have, I don't have, like, I don't have room for a big... I'm getting so personal. (laughs) (laughs) I don't have room for a big German Shepherd, even though I objectively think that German Shepherds are, are better dogs. Yeah, that was my takeaway too. Like the top dogs are not reflecting people living in a densely packed city. Um, So yeah, I have to, I would think that having the actual, here's the types of dogs people own is probably more accurate to understand dog ownership in the US versus, versus preferences. In general, when we see a mismatch between, you know, stated preference and revealed preference, so how people respond to polls and their actual behavior, Can you always say that one is more significant than the other? Do you just have to look at context, like in this case, where where are people living? Do they have the capacity to own big dogs, et cetera? I mean, if you're looking for, you know, someone's favorite dog and what dog they own is not the same thing, right? A contrast might be something like um, a poll asking someone if they got vaccinated versus the actual fact of if they got vaccinated or not, right? Because there you, I mean, like the poll is just a, approximation for something that's kind of like objectively verifiable, right? But this is not quite the same thing. And so I'm all in favor of like revealed preference for for some things, especially questions where people might have some incentive to be misleading to pollsters. But you're making a little bit of a apples to oranges or, you know, retrievers versus poodles comparison. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, I'm sorry. No, I I am absolutely loving it because we're about to talk about uh, infrastructure. So get as many Mm. laughs in as you can. Uh, All said and done here, this is a good use of polling or bad use of polling by YouGov. I think think you've all said it's a good use of polling, but I just want to make sure. Again, all dogs are good dogs, so it's a bad use of polling. Uh, Okay, okay, (laughs) actually, okay, that's right, that's right. Sarah? It's fine. Where's the cat poll? You know, where's the yeah. are you a cat person? I am. I exit am. this Skype call right now <laughs> out of here. Absolutely not. Um, Nate, dog or cat person? Neither really, but more of a dog than cat. Yeah. Hmm. Neither. Wait, that's even I don't know. Is being a cat person or being neither worse? I'm going to have to act, like I know Tony's a dog person. Uh, Tony, which is worse, being a neither or a cat person? Neither is worse. Okay, Nate, you need to GTFO. <laughs> okay. I'll go practice. He's like, I'll bye, go. bye. I'm in All right. Actually, I have some poker to play. I got to get breakfast um, here. I got to, like, yeah. <laughs> talk to my poker coach. I have a poker coach. Oh, wow. You have a poker coach? Sure. Why not? People have tennis coaches. Wait. Who, like, teaches you how to play poker? I would, like, I would think, like, does Nate Silver really need somebody to teach know, him how to play say. poker? I felt like you were the teacher, Nate. Again, like, the analogy yeah. is, like, to a tennis coach, right? I'm not a professional poker player. I'm, like, quite proficient. Um, but if you were, like, a, you know, a serious, like, amateur um, uh, tennis player and you wanted to get better, then you'd hire a tennis coach, right? And so I have a poker coach. What is one thing that your poker coach taught you um, so far that you think has improved your game? Um, I mean, there are a lot of things I'm working on. Partly you just kind of go through and like talk about like um, different situations and you kind of learn from that. I mean, part of it is just like, how do you balance risk and reward in a poker tournament where on the one hand, in poker, you have to be aggressive to win money, 
right? On the other hand, like in a tournament, if you bust out, then you're broke, right? So there's someone said to be more conservative and just kind of how you, how you balance that is a very tricky question. Um, you know, I think he's probably pushed me toward being a little bit more conservative in certain spots. Um, but like in this tournament, in this tournament, frankly, there are like a lot of good players. And so like, I don't presume to have that much of it. Actually, I shouldn't talk about this because there might be people listening who I'm playing against by the time this podcast comes out. So I'm not going to reveal anything about my strategy. Whoops. Yeah. Whoops. <laughs> All right. Well, we should move on. We've managed to cover UFOs, America's favorite dog, and Nate's poker strategies in the first 15 minutes of this podcast. So I'm going to proclaim this the best 538 politics podcast we have ever done. Uh, anyway, let's move on and talk about the bipartisan infrastructure plan. As I mentioned at the top, President Biden is backing a bipartisan infrastructure bill put together by 10 senators and being led by Kristen Sinema from Arizona and Rob Portman from Ohio. There are only five Republicans in this group, and there would need to be at least 10 Republican votes to overcome the filibuster in the Senate. There are also questions about whether progressives within the Democratic caucus would support this plan. The bipartisan plan excludes the majority of Biden's original $4 trillion worth of infrastructure and social services proposals. Democrats' current plan is to try to pass those proposals using reconciliation and only Democratic votes on a similar time frame to this bipartisan plan, the $600 billion plan. Last week, Biden indicated that he saw the two bills as a package and wouldn't sign one without the other. That upset Republicans working on the bipartisan plan who didn't want policies that they don't support tied to this plan that they do support. It looks like things might be back on track after the White House told Republicans that the two bills aren't linked, or at least that's what Republicans who went on the Sunday shows said yesterday. Uh, you know, we will we will see how precarious this kind of coalition of bipartisan senators still is. But this prompts, you know, my first question. Doesn't seem like this is going to be particularly easy. There's a lot of kind of different interests that need to be skirted around and basically compromised with in this process. So why pursue a bipartisan agreement on infrastructure in the first place if you are President Joe Biden? Well, because he ran saying he would do that. I think that is kind of like the biggest I mean, thing here. I mean, is that a reason to do anything? <laughs> no, but I mean, th part of his 2020 campaign, right, was like, I'm going to work across the aisle. I'm going to heal America's divides. And we've talked a lot on this podcast about how he has been able to do that, not been able to do that. I mean, this really is the first legislative accomplishment he can point to where it truly is bipartisan in nature. I know, you know, the advisor Anita Dunn loves to say that like, oh, but bipartisan as if Republican voters like it. Like polls show the American public is not buying that. They think of bipartisanship as, okay, Republican lawmakers and Democratic lawmakers are getting behind this. Um, it is true, though, that polling also indicates that when it comes to bipartisanship, Americans really don't care that much. They want their side to do better. They want their side um, to get more out of the deal. They want the other side to compromise more. That said, though, you know, a poll from Learning Consult found that 75% of voters respected politicians when they made the efforts to be bipartisan. Um, and so I think that's what you're seeing here. Biden is also widely thought of in that same poll. He was the Washington leader who was thought of as um, most willing to compromise. I think, you know, that plays to voters. It's also, it's infrastructure, right? Who can't get behind infrastructure? In poker, we would call this a free roll, right? A free roll is a situation in which there is no downside and only upside. Um, and so like, if Biden gets these bipartisan agreements, right, then it will look like it will set a path for bipartisanship. He kind of keeps a campaign promise. He can still put back whatever he wants into the reconciliation bill later on. Um, so it's kind of, you would think like there's a lot of kind of upside, not much downside for Biden. I mean, there might be downside if he, if he like says this is going to happen and it doesn't happen, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's the one limit to the free roll. Like, I agree with you, but then I really don't understand what he did last week where it's like, okay, I'm now not going to sign this bill until I pass the other one with no Republican support that isn't very popular among Republicans. Um, it seems like a weird strongmanship there. And it's also like now some senators, Republican senators who have been in favor of this initial bipartisan bill are like, 
oh, if, you know, Manchin supports the reconciliation bill, I'm actually not going to support this now. And it just seems to add additional complications to this. I don't know if Democrats thought through fully. I guess he's, I guess the strategy is like, if he makes it like this is the only train that's leaving the station, right, um, then you might start to have problems on the progressive side of things, potentially. Um, and he also knows that like the more valuable train, we're really mixing metaphors here, is like the reconciliation train, right? There's going to be more money in that. It'll be more in line with the priorities that the White House wants and that um, and that the party base wants, um, including on stuff we'll talk about later on like like climate mitigation um, efforts. Uh, so so he doesn't want to like jeopardize that by having this deal blow up, right? And then I don't know. It's just so it's like a sign of of. It's, he's he's hedging his bets, I think, actually, right? It seems like the way that he forces the issue with Republicans is like, okay, we're going to, if you don't get on board with this bipartisan bill, then we just only pass reconciliation. At a, at a certain point, like, they'll probably, like, Joe Manchin said that he wants to do something bipartisan here. Kristen Sinema, who's leading these negotiations, also has indicated that it's very important to her. So it's kind of like Joe Biden playing along with the wishes of Manchin and Sinema in, to a certain extent, right? Like, not just his own wishes as a president who ran on bipartisanship. And because it seems like if they tried to only do reconciliation first, Manchin and Cinema would object. Yeah, they clearly think it's important, these swing voters, uh, Manchin and Cinema clearly think it's important for them to at least attempt this route, right? But like, in some ways, it's also a sign of like Biden acting in good faith in the sense that like everyone knows Democrats have the reconciliation option. If they really screw up how they play their hand, then maybe somehow they can't cobble together a majority for that either because of problems on the left or the right or the center, I guess you'd prefer, right? Um, but he's saying like, look, it's obvious that like we have this tool in our arsenal. We're going to use it at some point. And so let's just kind of be honest about that, right? And not try to like, not try to pretend that there's some leverage where if Republicans can like really, really compromise and there won't be reconciliation, He's kind of taking that option off the table, I guess. So the other question I have here is not just about what's motivating Joe Biden in this situation, but what about these 10 senators, the five Republicans and five Democrats? Why are these specific people working on a bipartisan bill and not, not you know, the other 90 senators that are in the Senate? Um, is it electoral considerations? Is it an ideology that they just prefer working together across the aisle? Um, what uh, What's going on? Yeah, no, I think there's a couple things. One, I do think there are electoral considerations here. You could see someone like, you know, Senator Susan Collins or Lisa Murkowski. It could really help them in, protect, in particular electorally, particularly for Murkowski, who's up this year facing uh, a challenger to the right. You know, this is an incentive then for Democrats in her state, because Alaska's so red, to say, hey, maybe vote for me so that this other um, Republican running doesn't win, because they won't support some of your priorities in the same way. Um, and then can see the same logic in reverse for Cinema and Shaheen in New Hampshire. You know, New, New Hampshire and Arizona are red, purplish states, Arizona more than New Hampshire. But at the same time, you know, someone like Portman, he's retiring. Romney is presumably in a safe seat given Utah's demographics, um, even though I know he's been censured by the state party, like running as a Mormon in Utah with a large Mormon base um, and a pretty standard Republican that should be helpful for him. And then, yeah, Manchin defines, it defies the partisan lean of his state. So to some extent, it you know, it's electoral considerations, yes, but it's also, I think, a belief in how this is how government works. And it is embodied by, you know, make no make no coincidence here that it is legislators who are a little bit more moderate on both ends of the spectrum that ideologically speaking, even though they're in different parties, there's how they vote in Congress isn't that different. So the fact that they're coming together to try to work out a compromise, I think also just speaks to how they legislate. There's also a tradition of, you know, senators, I think, for the most part, still do somewhat care about the constituents in their state, right? Um, and this is something which has very infrastructure, very visible benefits, and also probably has, depending on the program, I have to study exactly what's in the bill, but like 
probably larger benefits for like more rural states that just have like a lot of land and roads and maybe not many people, right? But where you're actually like building things that might help a state like Alaska, for example, probably more that would help, I don't know, New Jersey or something, right? And so like kind of, it caters a little bit to the kind of, I would argue, healthy bias in the Senate toward wanting to look after your state's best interests and maybe also the kind of unhealthy bias toward like kind of, you know, large square shaped rural states that um, that would maybe benefit a little bit more than than smaller states from infrastructure programs. And Nate, as you mentioned, we should talk about what is actually in the bill. So to, just to tease it out a little bit more, um, I mentioned some of the, the key pieces of the legislation at the top. But Sarah, what else should we know about what's in this infrastructure uh, you know, compromise? Yeah, essentially, it's just money for our nation's roads, rails and bridges. Um, you know, there is funding in there for electric buses, charging stations for electric vehicles. Um, so some bits in there to help reduce pollution, which was a priority um, in this infrastructure plan as it was initially conceived. And there's also $47 billion um, for communities to be more resilient in the face of national disaster. That said, though, that's about the extent of like the climate change relief bits. And as we'll talk later today, you know, that is kind of where Democrats then in the second bill through the reconciliation process are going to focus those efforts. So this really is just like hard brass and tack infrastructure structure, roads, rails, and bridges. And internet, right? I think broadband internet is something that I've heard like every politician talk about ever. All right, I got a question. Which state has the most miles of road? Nebra- Nebraska. No. The most miles of road? It's going to be... Alaska. It's going to be... Isn't it going to be urban? Because there's going to be roads that like circ- go around and around in circles. Like, in New York City, there's roads on every block, right? I don't know. I My guess is that it's going to be like California. I don't know. California. It's Texas by a lot. Okay, okay Texas. Okay. I, I mean, Texas has got all, yeah. Because it's both urban I guess that should have been and obvious. big. Yeah. So it's got like both, but like, but like for example, um, Kansas has more road than New York. Yeah, huge, I really? mean, huge freight trucking industry there. They're often a hub for a lot of um, different trucks going out across the U.S. That much I knew. Uh, yeah, I should have. I should have known better. I have. I have driven yeah. on the Katy Freeway, the widest freeway in the world. I think, which I the on and off ramp section is like sixteen lanes wide or something like that. North Dakota has more than twice as much road as New Jersey. So it's more about the physical landmass of the state. Yeah. Interesting. So important to keep in mind here in terms of like who is motivated to vote for infrastructure. Presumably Democrats in some ways would hold this vote over Republicans' head if they vote against infrastructure, particularly like a hard infrastructure plan to say, you know, in the 2020 midterms, for example. Um, so as you all mentioned, there are ideological considerations, people who are just more prone to collaboration, bipartisanship, et cetera, for their own reasons. There's electoral considerations. I want to dig back into a piece of the electoral considerations for a minute. Sarah, at the top, you said that Americans respect bipartisanship, but don't necessarily like want people within their own party to compromise. Um, can we elaborate on that a little bit? Because I was looking at this morning consult poll that our colleague Jeffrey Skelly wrote up recently. And in the poll, it shows that, quote, this is Jeffrey Skelly's writing, 85% of voters said it was very or somewhat important for legislation to have bipartisan support. 69% agreed that policies with bipartisan backing were the best policies. And 62% disagreed with the idea that it was a waste of time for politicians to seek bipartisan support. What's more, there was no meaningful differences between how Democrats and Republicans answered these questions. So it seems like, at least on surface level, Americans want lawmakers to compromise and work together. Oh, totally. And that's why I think, like, in the long run, bipartisanship still matters electorally. There are some questions, though, that give um, respondents the ability to say, like, okay, 
which party should compromise more. And that's where polling always shows that if I'm a Democrat, you know, I think that Democrats should not compromise as much. Or if I'm a Republican, well, Republicans shouldn't compromise as much. And there's even um, an academic study that looks at you know, who sponsors bills and legislation. And they have found that if the bill itself is like sponsored by Democrats and I'm a Republican, even if I agree with what the bill does, I will be less likely to be in favor of it, just given who's sponsoring it. Um, so there, there's that tension between, on its surface, Americans like this idea of bipartisanship, the two parties sorting it out, coming to a consensus, but when you really put their like feet to the fire to ask them about it, they still want their party to do better um, and will actually walk away from the legislative process kind of feeling like a defeat if it's not perceived as their party doing well on it. Those are interesting caveats, Sarah. So just wrapping things up here, it seems like Democratic leadership, President Biden, have some some difficult needles to thread in terms of making everyone happy, the progressives, the moderates getting both this, you know, kind of bipartisan hard infrastructure bill passed and their social services and climate priorities, et cetera. Does it seem likely that at the end of 2021, there will have been both a bipartisan infrastructure bill and a kind of second, more expensive Democratic priorities passed through reconciliation bill? No. I'm going to... Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, okay, we agree. In some sense, like, both parties have an incentive to look like they tried. Um I don't know they have actually have an incentive to actually reach a compromise. I mean, you know, cynically, um, Republicans might think, why hand Biden a victory? Anything, you know, we get he's going to do, we don't give him he's going to do anyway, right? So why kind of put a bipartisan halo on it? I mean, there are also implications for like, what's it mean for like um, elections reform bills, right? I guess if you're a Republican, you might argue that like, okay, if you're not willing to compromise on infrastructure, when infrastructure is very popular, the ask from Biden is, quote unquote, reasonable. It's only reasonable because he gets all the other stuff, reconciliation, but like, go with that for the time being, right? And where a, a number of Republicans are on board with it, maybe not 60, but maybe, you know, but maybe up to 55 or 57 or 58 votes, right? If you then filibuster that bill, then that looks bad. And then maybe Manchin says well, screw you guys, right? Maybe we'll reduce the filibuster to 55 and it has to be a talking filibuster. So there are implications for um, for other types of bills. Again, notably the kind of HR1 slash S1 slash um, uh, voting rights slash election interference family of legislation. Yeah, and I think the other thing to you know caution here is, okay, so Democrats have really trimmed down this one bill, reached a compromise with Republicans. It's just hard infrastructure. To Galen's point, that seems like if Republicans maybe vote against that, you know, that bites them in the 2022 midterms or something. That said, though, they're then hanging all of their like hopes for the bigger ambitious proposals on this reconciliation process when we already saw that the Senate budget parliamentarian did not think the minimum wage like was something that you could pass through the reconciliation process. I could see the same thing happening with some of the more um, aggressive stances on either, you know, limiting emissions in various industries or trying to get, you know, more electric cars on the road. That could be something that the Senate budget parliamentarians just like, no, that's outside our purview. And it's hard to see, too, how someone like Sanders, Manchin and Biden will all get on the same page um, to pass something as progressive and sweeping as Biden initially laid out. I mean, there there are risks to Democrats, too, when you only have 50 votes exactly, right, which is that um, maybe Joe Manchin decides he's going to object. Maybe someone on the left does. Maybe a group of Democrats in the House object. Also, maybe some senator dies um, and is replaced by a member of the Republican Party, right? Um, you get a lot of very old people in the Senate and like, it's happened before. And all of a sudden, then you have a Mitch McConnell Senate majority. So there are risks either way here. And that also kind of affects the calculation. All right. Well, we will continue to track how infrastructure moves forward in Congress. Uh, promises, I think, given what you've all said, to be somewhat interesting over the coming months. Um, so I'm sure we'll return to it. But for now, let's talk about whether Republicans are shifting their stance on climate change. 
On the topic of bipartisanship, a somewhat bipartisan House vote last Friday approved the reinstatement of Obama-era standards for cutting methane. Twelve House Republicans supported it. But more to the point, a recent New York Times report said that there is a growing number of Republican lawmakers trying to tackle climate change. According to the report, Republican Representative John Curtis from Utah announced the creation of a conservative climate caucus, and House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy is making plans for a Republican climate change task force. But public opinion polls don't necessarily reflect Republican voters moving in the same direction. Gallup released results from their annual poll on American attitudes on climate change this spring, showing that 59% of Americans believe that the effects of global warming have already started. According to the survey, public opinion remained relatively stable over the past five years, but there is a widening gap between Republicans and Democrats. So in this most recent poll, 82% of Democrats believe that the effects of climate change have already begun, while 29% of Republicans believe the same. So let's talk about what is going on here. Joining us for this segment is 538 lead science writer Maggie Kurth. Hello, Maggie, and welcome. Hi, how are you guys? Good, good. We've had a a, a kind of a rowdy podcast so far. Infrastructure was a little more tame than UFOs and America's favorite dog, but you know, what can you expect? How are you doing? How's life? I'm I'm good. I'm angry I wasn't there for the UFOs and the infrastructure. Um, are they gonna are they gonna build us some bridges? Because that that would be if the aliens do that, I'm I will vote for them. Kodos and Kang, twenty twenty four. Um, all right. Well, that sounds uh, treasonous. I don't I don't I don't know if we're supposed to support the extraterrestrial life that comes to invade us. In any case, Maggie, you have studied cl- public opinion on climate change for a long time and climate change itself. Why might there be some effort amongst Republicans to create policies on climate change now? There's there's like three or four different threads of things, some of which are contradictory. So bear with me a little bit here, or at least appear contradictory, I guess. But I think it is interesting to me that like the Republicans that care about climate change have already always been there. Um, You know, I have seen polls dating back to 20 years at this point, where you have really high rates overall and pretty high rates even among Republicans for American support for things like, you know, renewable energy, for support for like, hey, we don't spend enough on, um, on environmental projects. You know, like that stuff has been there sort of percolating in the background. You have people who in the Republican Party who have been working on climate change, getting other people to understand and accept climate change within the party for a very long time. Last year, at one point, I was interviewing uh, Wayne Gilchrist, who was a Republican congressman from Maryland in the 90s and early 2000s, and also Bob Inglis, who was a Republican congressman from South Carolina in the early 2000s. And like both of them were working on climate related projects when when they got voted out. Um, so there's, it, it is not that there was never this thread, you know, there's been evangelical environmentalist groups for years and years and years. But I think one of the things that I sort of keep coming back to with this is that Americans will do these polls where they show pretty high support for climate change action, you know, the policies that would be the kinds of things you'd want to see for climate change action, or where they show fairly high, you know, I believe climate change is happening. And then we, every year, every election year, we go into looking at like what people are voting on and it's never climate. I mean, like, I think, (laughs) I think Tony and I have made a game at this point of sitting through the, the debates of every election and like just waiting for someone to like talk about the environment or talk about climate. And it just, it doesn't happen because the voters are not making their decisions on that. So like, even if it's something they support, you end up with these situations where the Democrats get in power and they don't really do much. And when they're not in power, there's not a push for the Republicans to do much. So, okay. To kind of nail down to the point here. Yeah. Yeah. You're saying the reason that Republicans have not previously put together these kinds of task forces on climate change in Congress is because voters don't care. 
I mean, I think that it's definitely part of it. I think that the Republican Party has been co-opted in a lot of ways by anti-climate activism, you know, um, so there's that aspect to it also. But like, even with these people who do care about it, who have been there, who have been trying, you get around to these situations where even the people, even the the Democrats don't do a whole lot. It's hard to it's hard to have anything happen when the people that believe in it don't do anything and the people who don't believe in it are still trying to like fight their way forward. To build on what Maggie was saying, it just it isn't an important issue um, for people at the ballot box. This is particularly true among Republicans. Pew in 2021 here asked adults, you know, of these 10 issues, which are the most important to you? Respondents could choose more than one. You know, only 10% of Republicans said that climate change was their top issue. In fact, a majority said it was not climate change that mattered the most to them. And then I think the second part is, as Maggie was getting at, like some Republicans really do support um, a variety of different proposals, whether it's planting trees to absorb carbon emissions, providing a tax credit for carbon capture, storage, sequestration. Maybe that'll come back in. We've talked about it for years and years. But what's interesting is when you break out Republicans Republicans by ideology, um, you know, most identify as conservative, right? And one thing Pew has found is Republicans who identify as conservative versus moderate or liberal are much less likely to want to support various climate change initiatives. And so then it kind of begs this question, if Trump has moved the party in this different direction about what it means to be conservative, like what is the real appetite among Republicans for these environmental issues? And it's not that, like, I think this is interesting because it used to, like, environmentalism used to be a pretty bipartisan thing on a policy-wise basis. You know, you actually had, like, five years around the late 80s and early 90s where you can just watch this split apart in several different ways. And it's it, it's mind-blowing how fast it happened. And there are researchers who have studied this who think that it, had a lot to do, like the polarization had a lot to do with the end of the Cold War. And so a lot of the things of like themes of anti-Americanism, themes of, you know, trying to trying to make a inroads for socialism in the United States got attached to environmentalism that had been previously attached to these fears had been attached to the Soviet Union. And like, that's one of the theories that sociologists have about why this happened, particularly like around 1990. But like 1990 is the tipping point. And it has been harder to get bipartisan stuff happening ever since then. Um, I think one of the things that stood out to me in that vein was when I talked to Bob Inglis last year, he had said that you know, a lot of the evangelicals of his generation were really connected to this idea that like environmentalism was earth worship, that it was this idea that you were sort of putting the planet before God, that you were, you know, trying to replace God with nature, and that he didn't see that among younger evangelicals. Um, and I think that's... I think that that's something that is held true in some polls also, though you might have to remind me on that. I'll have to check that. But I think like if we're getting movement from the Republican Party on this now, it probably has a lot to do with that, like younger generations, actually, this is something that they are less stridently opposed to. Yeah. Nate, what are you thinking about kind of why this might be happening now? Is I mean, is this even is is this even notable to be talking about? Uh, you know, a task force or a you know conservative climate caucus. Um, does this seem to be representing some kind of shift? Like Maggie said, there are several kind of complicated threads to untangle here, right? Um, one is that so if you ask people like in that pew poll, it's actually kind of related to the dog question from earlier, right? Where if you kind of give a people a list of 10 issues and say, rate them on a scale of zero to 10, or just identify however many you think are the most important issues. You can pick all 10 if you want, but you know, um, then Democrats at least kind of tend to rank climate change highly. Republicans don't, at least Democrats do, right? 
if on the other hand, you just kind of ask people and say, hey, open-ended question, top of mind, what's the most important issue today? Then very few people say climate change. Only 3% of voters overall in this Gallup poll um, in May, for example, identify climate change as the most important issue. And that's of both parties. Of both parties. So maybe it's 6% Democrats, but it's still pretty low, right? right? Mm -hmm. Um, In part because there's always something else that is more pertinent, right? When you asked this question um, last June, it was, oh, the racial protest or police brutality for most of the past year. Apart from last June, it's the coronavirus. In 2009, it's the economic crisis, right? You know, you see now immigration is rising, right? Race relations is still fairly high. And these are things that the media tends, you know, crime is not high now, but may rise, right? It's kind of, kind of what's driving the media conversation. It's kind of top of mind. So like climate change has become kind of less or never has become salient or has become maybe less salient with discussion of like heat wave that's now on the West coast will eventually reach the East coast that might, you know, trigger wildfires and so forth that might change again. But like, um, but the irony is that maybe by being kind of less salient, um, it's actually easier to get things done. Right. Um, If Sean Hattie is spending all of his time um, talking about critical race theory and immigrants, and not about Al Gore and polar bears, um, then maybe it's actually easier to find bipartisan compromise on the environment and on climate change. I think we mentioned earlier how there's a poll showing a decreasing number of Republicans believe that um, that climate change is already having effects. Um, you know, part of it may be the sorting where now that Democrats have kind of won over um, college-educated suburban voters, I mean, they're a big a split by education on the environment. So it's not like the GOP has like necessarily escalated its anti-climate change rhetoric relative to everything else, but it may just be as the resorting of political coalitions occurs that like, um, that um, you now have this kind of even more rural Republican base, even more non-college Republican base. And those people are less inclined to believe in climate change to begin with. Um, if you are a suburban Republican member of Congress, you want to make sure that the GOP still does well enough, at least in your suburb, um, to to keep you in office, right? And so you're trying to like kind of quietly, I guess, negotiate on an issue that people in that group, the people who are kind of wavering away from the GOP, and if the GOP is now anti-climate change, this professional couple in, you know, whatever the suburbs of Chicago, where their son and daughter are very concerned about climate change. They are too, and they're just kind of barely hanging on by a thread to the GOP post-Trump. Um, this kind of might give them one reason to hang on, I suppose. So that gives us some sense of maybe the culture wars in, in other areas besides environmentalism taking a front seat and some of the aspects involved in the realignment of the two parties and what Republican incentives might be there. I'm curious, though, Maggie mentioned a kind of generational turnover to some extent and whether young Republicans might be pushing the party in this direction as well. What data do we have on that? Yeah, so Pew actually did a really deep dive looking at the different generations so Gen Z, millennials, silent generation, baby boomers, all all those terms. And I'll try to explain them as best as possible. I find the the names so confusing. But what they're seeing is that um, young adults, period, both Republicans and Democrats, are much more likely to say that, you know, we need to give all of our resources, essentially, even if it comes at the expense of dealing with other important problems to climate change. So about half of Republicans who either in Generation Z or millennials, we're talking like 35 and under here, roughly, um, they give top priority to reducing the effect of climate change today climate change today, even if it means fewer resources to deal with other important problems. But when you compare that to Generation X and the baby boomer and older Republicans, about 70% say no, there are other more important issues to deal with. So that is about, you know, a 20 point gap there in terms of how younger Republicans are thinking about this issue versus older Republicans. And there's a really interesting split over fossil fuels where Again, the younger generation of Republicans are more interested in renewable energy, solar, wind, um, whereas the older Republicans, you know, want to expand fossil fuels. And in some of those, there's like a 30 point gap, for instance, for expanding offshore oil and gas drilling um, amongst young Republicans and older Republicans. And you just 
there is a generational divide among Democrats. It's just not as pronounced, which makes it so interesting that among Republicans who are, you know, more widely perceived as not believing in climate change to the same extent, not thinking it poses as much as a threat, there is some disconnect with younger Republicans being more energized by this issue than older Republicans. Well, and I think this is reminding me, there's a study that I saw that's fairly old at this point, but like uh, it was from 2013. And they were looking at the content analysis of evangelical periodicals. So Christianity Today, Sojourners and World. And they looked at that from like 1984 to 2010 and were finding not only a bigger diversity of opinion on things like environmentalism, uh, within those subgroups, but also that you were getting more fracturing over time. So we're having like this partisan split, like we talk about the partisan split in environmentalism between Democrats and Republicans, but we don't often talk about like within this world of conservative evangelicals, there is a not partisan split, but there is still a splitting, a still a fracturing of you know, these kind of hardening lines on like who cares about the environment and who doesn't. And that's been going on for a really long time. I think an important piece in all of this is how the polarization started in the first place. And there's plenty of research showing that by and large, Americans don't develop their own opinions on climate change because they read all of the scientific research. They get it from elite cues. And so you have, you know, leaders within the Democratic Party saying, climate change is real and important and we need to take measures to stop it. And then uh, on the right, you have Trump, for example, saying that it's a hoax, um, but other Republicans kind of perhaps downplaying its importance, the degree to which humans are responsible for it, or talking about the degree to which other nations like China um, are playing an increasing role in, in emissions and so on and so forth. So are the circumstances that created that polarization, that created the incentives for Republicans to downplay and Democrats to up play or however you want to phrase that, are any of those incentives lessening? I mean, one thing that comes to mind, of course, is the oil and gas industry. And for example, you know, the energy companies increasingly investing themselves in renewable energy. Um, you know, is that playing a role here in, in maybe decreasing Republicans' incentives to um, downplay climate change? I would be really curious whether the science of climate change feels more simple to understand to younger people who have grown up hearing about it for their entire lives. Because I remember like from the the interview I did with Wayne Gilchrist where he was talking about like bringing E.O. Wilson in to talk to Newt Gingrich back in the 90s and like having the Republican leadership in the room and people being like, and I haven't had to think about this since I was trying to memorize the different types of clouds. Like I don't, I, I, this is not making a whole lot of sense to me. And like Bob Inglis had like a similar conversation with me about like trying to explain climate science to his 80 something year old parents at the time over the dinner table. And it was really hard for people to wrap their heads around. And I think that this was surprising to me at the time because like, I don't think of it as being that hard. And like, granted, I am, you know, I, I am a science journalist and I have spent my whole career writing yeah, about I don't, this. I don't, know, I don't know if that's... I don't know, right. Fair, like, but I think also, like, I think there's a difference between, like, if you didn't grow up having to think about that at all during your educational years, and if you did, and, like, maybe it just, maybe it is easier to explain now. Maybe it makes more sense to younger people in a way that it doesn't, that it's harder to grasp when, if you're, if you didn't grow up hearing about it all the time. I think the industry pivots you were hinting at to Galen are important here, especially in the sense of like, you know, Texas leads the country essentially in renewable energy production, right? And here it is a very red state, right? And I don't think they would phrase it in that way, maybe. Um, but what you're seeing with like this Curtis group with the Conservative Climate Caucus, you know, Right now, I think he said that there are 38 House Republicans of the members. So like that's 18% of the caucus. It's hard to assess that as like a huge movement, but it makes me think. So they said that, you know, part of the caucus wants to push back on radical progressive climate proposals. And that just makes me think about what Maggie was saying earlier about how so much of climate change and fear or misperceptions around it has been baked in with socialism. And you can see that in the messaging. And so I wonder then, you know, 
if oil and gas is pivoting to more renewable energies, you know, are Republican lawmakers starting to see that? They want to have a voice in that conversation. They don't want the far left to have like too much, you know, say in climate change. Maybe that does signal a real shift um, because, you know, companies are shifting in that direction. I mean, keep in mind, too, that like the uh, NASA now estimates that the global temperature anomaly in 2020 was one point eight, four degrees Fahrenheit, so almost two degrees. Um, and you kind of tend to notice that even more on the extremes, um, the way that like a bell curve distribution works. And so so you do have, you know, 15 years ago, you could have science saying, science saying, hey, there are reasons to be worried about climate change. Temperatures have increased by, you know, half a degree Fahrenheit or one degree Fahrenheit. Um, that's kind of a pretty hard signal to pick up kind of in your exper experiential level, right? When temperatures fluctuate from, you know, very rapidly over the course of the seasons. But you begin to experience it more now that things are hotter. And so there is kind of a clearer signal that the average person might perceive. It gets very dangerous to attribute particular extreme events to climate change. Um, but, you know, but you hear more people kind of now saying, yeah, this is noticeable. The climate here is a little bit different than than when I was a kid. And as climate continues to warm, for better or worse, people will have those intuitions a little bit easier, I think. Hmm. Are we seeing some geographical variation in terms of who within the Republican caucus is supporting, you know, these kinds of initiatives, climate change initiatives within the party? You know, I'm wondering in particular, because there is geographic variance in the extent to which um, communities experience warming and changes in weather patterns, things like that. I mean, I'm thinking of in particular places like South Florida, where Republicans do quite well, like, is there more concern in the Miami area? Or, for example, Representative Curtis uh, is representing Utah, a state in the West where they're having severe droughts. Um, for Like, are we seeing, if it is, in fact, just people's own experiences that is shaping their interest in, in dealing with climate change, are we seeing geographic variation in the Republicans that are taking the lead on this? At least in questions that ask, like, do you see climate change affecting your local community? Yes, there is a difference in how Republicans answer that if they live on the coast versus if they live more inland. Interestingly, for Democrats, there's not a variation. It's just across the board. They say it affects them. Um, so there does seem to be like partisanship here is still playing a strong factor. But for Republicans who live really close um, to the coastline, 45 percent say, hey, it's impacting my local community, whereas only 31 percent say that when they live farther away. So I think that does speak to why like young Republican lawmakers are meeting in Miami versus, um, you know, meeting in, you know, the middle of America, Kansas or something to talk about these issues. All right. Well, as with most things we talk about on this podcast, we will see how this continues to play out. But I think we're going to leave things there for now. We've covered a lot of ground today. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Maggie, Sarah, and Nate. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Thanks. My name is Galen Druk. Tony Chow is in the virtual control room. Claire Bidigary curtis is on audio editing. And Emma Riley is our intern. You can get in touch by emailing us at podcasts at 538.com. You can also, of course, tweet at us with any questions or comments. If you're a fan of the show, leave us a rating or a review in the Apple Podcast Store or tell someone about us. Thanks for listening, and we will see you soon. <laughs>